Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Carnegis. Also joining me today is Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests to appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Don. Good to be here with you to briefly discuss the interview that you and Bonnie Dore did with IHMC's own York Wilkes. You were fortunate to have Bonnie join you as a co-host for this episode, as she has deep expertise in artificial intelligence, particularly in the area of natural language understanding, which was the primary topic of your discussion with York. And in addition to her work as a senior research scientist at IHMC, Bonnie is also an associate director. She and York are located at IHMC's Ocala, Florida research facility, while Ken and I are at IHMC's Pensacola location. Today's guest, York Wilkes, was another easy selection of the Double Secret Selection Committee. Unsurprisingly, the vote of the committee was unanimous. As everyone will hear in this episode, York is a pioneering AI researcher a great colleague and mentor to many here at IHMC, and a raconteur of the First Order. Yeah, I really enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Wilkes, who's such an interesting guy. Yes, York was on the ground floor when important topics like AI, the internet, and much else were in nascent stages of development. Before we get to today's interview, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk. And we are especially appreciative of all the blushingly wonderful five-star reviews piling up on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continuously and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews with an eye toward selecting the wittiest and lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. As always, if you hear your review right on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. And then you'd be the coolest person. <laughs> Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the nickname Love the Ocean. And here is the review. I just listened to Joan Vernico's STEM Talk, and I am convinced that I'm on my way to living a healthier life from the changes I've made incorporating what she said in her talk. What an inspiration she is and how proud I am to have met her at NASA, where I currently work, and know that even after her NASA days, she continues to research and publish. STEM Talk truly finds those brilliant and interesting people and encourages in-depth discussions. Continuous five stars. Thank you, Love the Ocean, and all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped make STEM Talk get off to such a great start. Okay, now on to today's interview. Dr. York Wilkes is a senior research scientist at IHMC. He is also a professor emeritus at University of Sheffield and a senior research fellow at Oxford University. He was the founding director of the EU-funded Companions Project on creating long-term computer companions for people. He now leads a team of researchers at IHMC who are designing solutions to a range of thorny issues in machine conversation understanding. Dr. Wilkes has, over the years, been supported by numerous funding agencies. His current work has been supported by the Tampa VA and by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, more commonly known as DARPA. Dr. Wilkes is the author or editor of 14 books and numerous scholarly papers. He is a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, the Association for Computing Machinery, the British Computer Society, and the European Association for Artificial Intelligence. He has been awarded the Lubner Prize and the Zampoli Prize. Dr. Wilkes earned two Lifetime Achievement Awards in 2008, the first presented by the Association for Computational Linguistics and the second from the Conference for Language Resources and Evaluation. In 2009, he was awarded the Lovelace Medal by the British Computer Society. STEM Talk. 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 So I'd like to welcome to STEM Talk, Dr. York Wilkes. York, welcome to STEM Talk. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And today I'm joined by a special guest, our co-host, Dr. Bonnie Dorr. Uh, Bonnie is an associate director and senior research scientist at IHMC working in natural language. Happy to be here with you, Don, and particularly pleased to join our chat with York Wilkes. Hi, York. Hi, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. uh, good to have you on board, too. So, York, tell us a little bit about your upbringing in North London. <sighs> 
Well, um, I was a war baby, a uh, second world war that is. Um, I come from a very poor sort of working class home. Uh, I, I have second world war memories, you know, Hitler, his, my part in his downfall. It's, you know, I, I tell war stories when after a few drinks, I'm joking, of course, <laughs> I was very small. Um, in England in those days, kids were sent out of London during the war to try and keep them away from the bombing. So I was moved around quite a lot. My parents were working in aircraft factories building bombers, so I wouldn't have seen much of them if I'd been there. So uh, that was my upbringing. I was lucky in that I, in those days, there were scholarships to good schools where you could get into for free, like grammar schools. Um, now we have a system of schools just like America where everybody goes to the same school. If we'd had those then, I'd be trapped there probably selling spare parts in North London now. But I didn't. I got a scholarship and went to a good school, and from there I got a scholarship and went to Cambridge. So in some sense, I escaped my upbringing completely. And how did you end up studying philosophy? Well, I seem to have always been interested at school. I it sounds an odd thing to say, but I look back at sort of, I think a school prize I won when I was 16. They gave you a prize at the end of every year if you came top of something. I see, I see I have a copy of Aristotle's Metaphysics that I asked for as a prize when I was 16. Now, that's a pretty bizarre thing for a 16-year-old to ask for, particularly as I probably couldn't read and understand it then or now. Um, so I must have been interested at 16. Seems very odd, but I didn't. We didn't do philosophy at school. Um, they don't in Britain. They do in France. Um, I did maths and physics all the way after 16 and went to Cambridge to do maths. I changed my mind after a year and switched to philosophy. So at Cambridge, uh, your mentor, Margaret Masterman, had a big influence on your life. Can you talk a bit about her and perhaps her mentor, Wittgenstein, and how that's influenced your own development? Yes. I mean, in that sense, I'm in a sort of apostolic succession of grandsondom to Wittgenstein, which, I mean, this sounds f odd for me. I mean, he was, for some people at least, the greatest philosopher of the century, not for others, um, but he was a very considerable person. Um, Margaret Marston was undoubtedly the biggest influence in my intellectual life. She was the philosophy tutor for the college I was at in Cambridge. She actually wasn't any good at teaching philosophy. The college didn't seem to know that, but that didn't matter. Um, she wasn't any good at teaching anything, actually, but she was a sort of genius, a sort of guru. She has a place in all the textbooks and histories of machine translation because she ran a little uh, thing called the Cambridge Language Research Unit that lived largely on American defense grants, even in those days. I'm talking the 1950s. She could get big grants from the Navy, NSF, uh, ARPA, as I think it then was, if it existed. I and mean, she did really work there because they were doing a kind of machine translation research that was different from other people's. And, uh, but I mean, it's very odd looking back to it. And yes, she was in Wittgenstein's classes. Um, he didn't like having women in his classes, apparently. He didn't like that. He said he didn't like ugly people. I mean, Wittgenstein had very definite prejudices, but she sung in there and um, she, he was the biggest influence in her life. And so this passed on to me. Um, I mean, I could say a word about what Wittgenstein's influence was on people, but you probably don't want this to turn into a discussion of Wittgenstein's philosophy, do you? Well, it's really interesting, actually, especially if you're an ugly female. I think you're screwed. Well, you can take that offline. That's not, that's not part of the podcast. Well, I mean, in a nutshell, <laughs> Wittgenstein thought that understanding the world required understanding language and that how our language work determined how we see the world. He wasn't anti-science at all. He was an engineer by background, and he respected science and mathematics enormously, but he thought for most everyday common sense life, how we saw the world and how the world was for us was determined by our language. So if we understood our language and how it worked, we would understand our world better. I believe that. I mean, I put a lot of time in Jap to Japanese in my time, and uh, I do believe the Japanese see the world differently. They see society differently and personal relations differently. It's not because of genetics. It's entirely because of their language. So I believe he was right. And uh, so therefore, for Margaret Masterman, investigating the structure of language was for her quite a natural thing to do with computers. Mm -hmm. She thought she was sort of carrying out a Wittgenstein mission, but with new technology. So... Yeah, absolutely. York, I understand that you spent the 60s in L.A. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, that's the old joke about if you can remember it, you weren't there, you know. But uh, <laughs> yes, I was there. And I guess I do remember it. And it was terrific. And it was the era of, you know, drugs, sex, rock and roll, all the stuff you read about. Um, I had I got away from Cambridge because we didn't have enough computing power there to do my thesis. And I was given a one year, one person AFOSR, Air Force Research Grant, mm -hmm. to come to LA, and I was attached loosely to what was called then Systems Development Corporation, an offshoot of RAND in Santa Monica, where I had an office, and I wasn't actually in anybody's group, but 
I attached myself to the group of Bob Simmons, who was a big guy in AI and natural language in those days. Great man, um, sadly dead. And uh, yeah, so I was had access there to a three, uh, IBM 360. I learned Lisp, and I started trying to program my thesis ideas in Lisp in LA. That's why I was nominally there, yeah. But of course, there's an awful lot going on outside. I mean, all night long, people were massing in the streets and you know, dressing in funny clothes and having a wonderful time. And of course, I was early 20s. I got caught up in that. Yes, it was great. <laughs> that sounds fascinating, actually. A lot more exciting than my experience at, uh, at Duke University. So <laughs> um, so you were also at Stanford when email emerged in the early 70s, and it was limited to a small circle of scientists. Can you tell us a little bit more about those halcyon days at Stanford? Yeah, I, I moved up. I mean, my Air Force grant ran out in L.A., then I stayed there for a while because I hadn't done enough computing and I supported myself. I got some parts on television and worked in TV for a while. They were just to support myself and finish my thesis. But when that was, and that was, the acting was the good job. I mean, there were also rubbish jobs delivering chicken into people's houses. But I was just doing the classic thing of, you know, getting my thesis, not written, but the computing done. I didn't write it there. I did the computing. Uh, then I went back to England, wrote the thesis and got it. But then I came back to America after another year, end of the 80s. Uh, sorry, 80s, what am I talking about? End of the 60s. I'm so sorry. End of the 60s. And by then, uh, I went up to Northern California. And everybody was doing that. I mean, the whole street party had moved to Northern California as well. I just happened to be part of the wave moving north. And uh, I got myself attached to an ONR grant to Patrick Supis, who was then a polymath at Stanford, who's only very recently died at a great age. And uh, he said to me, well, what you should do, he said, is going to get into McCarthy's AI lab. He said, just go and hang around there at night. He said, McCarthy comes in at night, you know, he might offer you a job. And he did. So I used to hang around at nights like people did because everybody worked at nights in those days. And one day McCarthy drifted through in the middle of the night. John McCarthy, one of the founders of AI, the inventor of Lisp, I mean, the inventor of the phrase artificial intelligence itself. Um, McCarthy drifts through in the middle of the night and offers me a job. And uh, I took it in the state for several years. And uh, that was huge fun. And as you say, there was the first email was just beginning between a handful of ARPA sites, a handful of universities. There were probably only a couple of hundred people on email. Uh, that was the great early days. And in those days, Minsky sent out one of his books by email to the frame book to be commented on. And that was obviously the first time that anybody had ever sent out a message of book length, you know, to comment on it. Was, we didn't realize how remarkable that was, that you could do that. You know, and they, they were amazing. Day. I mean, extraordinary people were at Stanford AI Lab in those days. And it was the beginning of the Mars lander vehicle. There was a sign out at the end, end of the lab driveway saying, beware I think it said beware moon vehicle or something. I've forgotten. The moon vehicle was four bicycle wheels attached to a box on which was a camera. And it occasionally had an outing and went around the driveway with a camera looking at things being controlled remotely from within. And that was an army, or I forget what it was, DARPA, grant, which was the beginning essentially of the Mars Lander Project and the autonomous vehicle. Mm, Extraordinary. Cool. Very interesting. Um, I want to ask you a bit about your interest in computer processing of human language and when and how all of that began. Um, just some background. Uh, the, the computer processing of human language that you work on is really all about getting computers to understand the meaning of what a person's saying and even their beliefs and intentions through the course of a conversation. And this is clearly at the bleeding edge of human language technology. Technology. So I'd really like to hear more about your interest in this sort of work and how all of that began. Well, in my case, it goes back to Margaret Masterman, who I mentioned. And she had, again, taken from Wittgenstein the idea that meaning was terribly important, understanding the meaning of language and if you could represent it. Now, I think she diverged here from Wittgenstein. I don't think Wittgenstein would have liked the idea of representing meaning explicitly. He would have thought that was strange. He thought... The language to be understood, and but always it will be another language that you understood it with, like by translation. You understand English by translating into French, maybe. He did also talk about mini languages. He people associate him with this phrase language games, because he talked about very tiny languages of a few words that a builder might use to order bricks or slabs. And he said that just a, a, a language of 10 words could have all the properties of a language when builders shouted to each other. I'm not sure I believe that, but he, he got this idea across they could be very small languages, almost primitive languages. And Margaret Masterman took that to mean that 
and of course, linguists were thinking along the same lines as well, but I think she was there ahead in some ways, that you could code the meaning of language with a small number of things that looked like English words but were called semantic primitives, semantic features, and that that would enable you to code the meaning of the language. And I, I got into that trend of thinking, and my thesis was about building a representation of English that was in another language of semantic primitives. That became very unfashionable later, but it was ahead of its time in the sense that there are a number of other people doing it. Roger Shank is an obvious name, and I could name another five people, but it was a minority view because to understand those days in the 60s, you have to realize that linguistics was totally dominated by Chomsky's view, that syntax was what mattered, grammar was what mattered. Mm -hmm. And we were dead set against that. We thought that was completely wrong. And that People, when they understood language, went for the meaning, goodness knows how, that's what we were investigating. But we weren't a overall concerned with this grammar and syntax because we could remember what someone had said, but we couldn't necessarily remember the words they'd used or the sort of syntactic constructions they'd used. So we were set against the syntactic view of the world. So my thesis was a representation system for the meaning of language. I applied to philosophical texts because I was still in the philosophy department and I was interested in metaphysical thinking and metaphysical argument. So I wanted to create a non-logical idea of argument that could be represented in that kind of language. But that was an extra on the side. The bit that's important for Bonnie's question is that when the thesis was over, I had left this representation scheme for language programmed in Lisp, which I took to Stanford. And when I was at Stanford, I turned it into a simple little machine translation system based on meaning and codings from English to French. And actually that got into the computer museum in the end as the first sort of completely semantically based machine translation system. It was no good as a translation system. No one could have used it for anything. It was just the idea of could you could you do it that way? Yeah. And and I mean this really sort of led to this notion of semantic parsing um, or interpreting human language as a formal representation of meaning. And that's relevant to today's cutting edge research in human language technology big time. Um, and, and the notion of semantic parsing, that's a term that you coined in the 70s, isn't that right? I think I did. I, I, it's hard, it's dangerous to claim you did anything first because someone will always find somebody else. But I think so, I'm pretty sure. Yes, we, we threw that, I threw that phrase around in the 70s. Um, but again, it, it, it comes back now and it looks a sensible phrase now. But at the time it didn't look a very sensible phrase. It looked like someone who was going up the wrong alley. Yeah. Also, the notion of human-centered computing, a touchstone of work at IHMC, has given rise to new frameworks where humans and machines are, in a sense, collaborating through dialogue. So how does your research reflect the concept of human-centered computing? Well, when I started turning my thesis work and semantic representation into a machine translation system, I wouldn't say it was well, it was human-centered in that people do translation, nothing else does. But it wasn't then based on the idea of cooperation between people and machines. But I certainly came around to that view, and I owe that view really to a man called Martin Kay, who's still, I think, the greatest living computational linguist, still at Stanford. And he also had worked for Margaret Masterman. We all came from the same place. Um, but Martin always plugged the idea that Translation was such a sophisticated matter that in the end it would have to be cooperation between humans and machines. Humans would never produce, he thought computers would never produce perfect machine translations. What they do is they produce good enough translations and we know they're good, they're free, they're Google, they're great. But for real translation of real things that matter, laws, constitutions, poetry, the human must be in the loop. And that's the way it's worked out. He was right. And I now I think I, I do accept that, that the great role of trans machine translation now is to be a tool for the human, uh, an industrial tool. I mean, every translation agency that's going to stay solvent is going to be using machine translation for rough drafts and humans to correct it and polish it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's really, you know, we're, we're speaking about human language technology. There are really two sides of the equation, um, particularly with respect to, or at least two sides, um, when we're trying to understand human-machine dialogue. All right. So um, getting the computer to understand what a human said, whether it's text or speech, um, the language understanding side, that is, or the language generation side, getting the computer to form responsive text or speech utterances based on what, what it's understood. So can you talk a bit about the challenges for each of these and how your research addresses these challenges? Yeah, well, you're spot on there. I mean, the issue of 
how we generate correct English. Our computer has got to generate correct English. It's a tricky one for people who play down the role of syntax. I mean, I said that I was part of a gang that played down the role of syntax, went for meaning. But when it comes to generating the stuff, you know you want to generate it correctly and accurately and not in some kind of pigeon. Now, that means that there must be a, some kind of grammar or syntax involved in that. And I don't believe we have to have it explicitly in our heads or be taught syntactic rules of school. I think that's just a nonsense. I mean, they do teach kids that now, but there are tr very traditional ways for a thousand years of teaching people to write good English. They don't involve syntactic rules. Uh, but we know good English when we do it, and we must be doing it with something like rules, whether we know it or not. So someone in my drift of thinking who says, we may understand without syntax, probably can't also say, and we generate perfect English without syntax, because we know if just one word's out of place in an English sentence, a good journalist, uh, anybody who writes correctly knows that word isn't there, it must be three words further on. You know that. It doesn't matter what it means, we know that. And therefore, we must be deploying rules when we write, I'm certain of that, whether we know it or not. And that means, I think, that we don't use the same syntax or syntactic component, as we say, when we analyze and understand and when we generate. A lot of people think we do, but I think their argument has always been a sign of weird brain efficiency argument. Oh, surely they said evolution must have designed us so that there's only one grammar in the head and we use it for analyzing, understanding, and we use it for generating. That's how you design a human, isn't it? Well, the trouble is humans weren't designed by these kind of guys. I mean, you know, we know they weren't. <laughs> Far from it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's quite possible that we use a grammar in a quite different way when generating language uh, from understanding. And I see no problem with that. I don't think the brain's an efficient entity at all. It's plainly not. Mm -hmm. The brain is clearly a massively inefficient thing, which is why it works as well as it does. In the field of computerized language processing, two perspectives have repeatedly emerged, symbolic and statistical. Can you explain and give your views on these two approaches? Yes. I mean, an important thing to say, and people often ignore this, is that both are very old. You know, the, the, the child's view of language processing history is that, oh, there were people who wrote symbolic representations like uh, people like Shank and myself back in the 60s and 70s. Then statistical work came into being in 1990-ish, took over, turned out they were right, and everything's been good since. Uh, there may be a few problems with statistical processing, but that's basically the ground of everything now. All these things are untrue. Um, there were papers back in the 1950s saying that we ought to do machine translation by statistical methods. The people who wrote them had no data and no computers to compute the statistics with. They couldn't do it. But they were quite, they believed in inf information theoretic models of meaning. They believed statistics was the basis of understanding and generating. Um, they, they had all the views, they just didn't have the equipment. I mean, Bonnie and I were talking about this yesterday. You could say <laughs> the biggest single shift in language processing over 50 years has been the advent of massive hardware. That's been probably more responsible for success than theoretical advances. And this is the clearest case. There always was statistical machine translation. It just couldn't be dried out. Now, but the rest, some of the story is true. I mean, there was this symbolic phase I've described in my own thesis days in the 60s, 70s. Along came that did produce machine translation. I mean, there was machine translation, quite effective machine translation, produced by purely symbolic methods. People forget this. I mean, you know, um, the great system, Sistran, which people used to laugh at, but actually turned out to be a very robust system, was entirely hand-coded in symbolic methods. Um, not the kind I was using, but a different kind of symbolic method. It didn't have any statistics in, put it that way, down in San Diego, and that's still running in uh, Dayton, Ohio, as far as I know. So yes. For, for Russian, still Russian, in use. Still in use. So, I mean, machine translation could be done by symbolic methods. There's no doubt about it. Um, then Fred Jelinek and others produced the statistical revolution around 1980, which was really an extension of speech research. Fred had shown that speech understanding could be enormously advanced by the statistical algorithms he had. He then said, now we're going to turn this loose on translation. He didn't said he didn't know anything about translation. He claimed not to know any foreign languages. In fact, he knew several foreign languages very well, but that was all part of the joke. His joke was that if you had the right statistics, knowing the language didn't matter. And it didn't really work, but it was amazing it worked at all. Mm -hmm. 
It just had data and it churned out. Half the sentences were basically correct as translations. And that you could either say, well, that's no good, half's no good. Or you could say, which I thought at the time, that's amazing. He's got half of them right. How did you do that? Um, and those methods have been refined and refined, and all the new Google translation engines are basically statistical now. Mm. Sometimes they work well, sometimes they don't. But they're easily produced given big data, and they're workhorses that kind of deliver. Mm. You can get a decent translation that you can understand almost anything now. Um, however, that wasn't the whole thing. The people who said, no, no, language can't be... A Based statistical, we we can't be statistical engines generating English. Um, a novel isn't just a very long Markov chain of seventy five thousand uh, entities, each of which is determined by the previous string. That's not true. Novels have structure. You know, novels are about stuff, um, and this is all true. And it's become clear over the last 10, 15 years that there are certain kinds of quite deep problems that statistical methods can't solve. And what most people seem to agree now the answer is, surprise, surprise, some kind of cooperation between statistical and symbolic methods will probably continue to do the job better and better. And that's a nice sort of outcome. It's almost a sort of reconciliation of enemies and, you know, uh, you can bring different engines together to cooperate in computing, in AI. And that, that's rather nice. Mm -hmm. Lots of my students have built dual engine systems of different types. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. Can you talk about the comeback in artificial intelligence and natural language processing of deep understanding and deep learning, um, how you define these, why you think they made a comeback, and why did they recede for a period? Yes, good one. I The word deep occurs in both, but I'm not sure, this is a personal hobby horse of mine, I'm not sure deep here has any very distinctive meaning. I mean, I think deep is a sort of ya, yippee, happy word. I mean, it, it means my stuff's good and it's better than yours and I'm deep, you're not. <laughs> and I'm deep, you're shallow. And uh, I don't believe that it's doing any work in those phrases. But I, I respect the use of it. Um, I take deep understanding to mean, with all due respect to colleagues who use it, that what I just said in the earlier piece of discussion, that um, we can bring back methods that we sort of abandoned after the statistical movement that attempt to excavate quite excavate represent quite deep features of language understanding the inferences the um i would well, i don't want to get into details there we don't want that sort of technicalities but features of language understanding that can hardly be expressed in statistical methods the wonderful thing about statistical methods is you don't really have to express anything of the whole of linguistics i mean um the statistical method has been associated with contempt for linguists and all they did fred jelinek famously said every time i fire a linguist my scores get better and of course this was a wonderful arrogance but quite untrue um he, he gloried in the fact that he didn't need to understand all that um, we found out since that you do and that the kind of things linguists investigate are important because human speakers and understanders express them. We must capture them. So if that's what deep understanding means, then it fits exactly what I said, that we're going to have a hybrid where methods to represent the difficult aspects of difficult. Um, how it is that you can say one thing and mean another all the time. You know, um, some Scotsmen are generous, uh, people say in my country. By that, they mean most of them are mean. It's uh, we know what they mean. They don't mean that. They mean something else. We all know when we say things and mean the opposite. I mean, nothing, no statistical method could possibly express such ideas. And yet linguists have spent decades discussing such ideas, and they're very important. Deep learning is a different matter. Um, that's a different, in a way, bigger wave. Deep learning, as you know, is now... <laughs> yeah. flushing venture capitalists out of holes to support the most amazing stuff. I think that also is an, an absurd misnomer. Deep learning really means the ideas that Jeff Hinton has been pushing about for years and have suddenly caught on, which simply means a more complex, layered structure of networks and feed-forward mechanisms of information from layer to layer. He's complexified the old picture of um, layered 
computing based on ideas from neural computing. It's not really based on brains, of course. It's based on networks. The way in which one network can do some computing and then feed the result forward to another network. And this seems a good idea. It seems to work and produce results. Deep learning, so-called, has definitely produced good results in facial recognition, speech recognition. It hasn't yet produced any very striking results in language understanding, which is what we're talking about. Now, they may wake up tomorrow. I may wake up tomorrow and find that they've cracked it all. I doubt it because I don't think it's that different from what went before. But we're living in a world where funding and hype and real science are mixed up in a strange way. And to get somewhere and to flush out real funding, you have to sound as if you are the new the new messiah. I mean, you have produced something so new. It's never true. Everything's related to what's gone before, you know. There's nothing new under the sun, says the preacher, you know. Ecclesiastes had it right. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it doesn't mean there aren't advances, yeah. but things are much more like what went before than people want to think. So deep learning has worked well in some areas and, and excellent. It's definitely an advance. Whether it's cracking the particular nut that we're talking about here, I'm skeptical. Your, can you tell us more about your early work in machine translation and how that's influenced your recent work? Well, I, th- I was trying to say earlier, um, I inherited machine translation because it was the prime task that Margaret Masterman's research center had been set up to do. Although, in fact, she was much more generally interested in a philosophical way, as I said, in representing meaning. And that's what she really cared about. But in those days, machine translation was where the money was, and that was a sensible thing to do. And she did have genuine ideas on machine translation, particularly using these primitive representation languages, like I said, which I inherited from her. Um, I then, as I said, after my thesis, parlayed that into a, although I did some machine translation, I parlayed that into a representation language for meaning. Mm. But later on in the 90s, I got into researching dialogue and that was really discontinuity. I'd come there, I've worked on several different things, and that may have been a mistake. I think that possibly in our field, just as if you get to a good university, you should never leave it. You know, I've moved around all my life. Fatal, fatal. Get to a good university, stick there. You know, no, move. <laughs> Similarly, if you set up a system of your own invention, stick with it. I can think of colleagues and friends who stuck with their system, put 30 years into them, and they've been right. I have moved on every 10 years to something else, and I claim for myself my own satisfaction. There's been a continuity in what I'm doing, but it's, sometimes it's hard to show. So, for example, I... I went with the statistical movement for some time and got very interested in what's called information extraction, how to lift superficial information from texts without deep parsing. And that was, I was one of the early people in that, and that was quite successful, but that was a diversion. Another piece of work I did, which is closing in on what you're talking about, was in the 70s and 80s, I got very interested in the representation of human beliefs. And I thought that was connected back to early work on semantic representation, that I began to think we couldn't understand language unless we could represent what the other person believes, believes about language, believes about the world. We had to have a model of them, the other. And we do to some extent. I mean, I, you understand me in, a, in part at least by having a view on what I'm believing because otherwise it doesn't make sense. I mean, you know, um, if you argue about democracy with somebody, it's more difficult if they say come from the old East Germany where democracy meant something completely different. And to argue with them at all, you'd have to have a model of what they meant. Otherwise, you couldn't talk. Mm-hmm. You'd just be hitting like a brick wall all the time. And so on. So I came to believe that belief uh, representation was very important. And I used some of the same methods of representing and some of the same algorithms of what I would have called sort of information minimization to select the correct representation. That was all part of my earlier work. That work, I published a book on it with a student, but that work went away. And it only came back in recent years. And in recent years, working at IHMC, uh, some people in the Navy rediscovered that work. And I've been able to, to deploy some of that belief work in work we now do at IHMC on modeling dialogue um, between groups where you want to have models of what different people in the discussion believe so you can see who's influencing who uh, to try and determine which of the group is the main influencer and has the leadership role from what they say and what they believe and are they causing other people to believe what they believe however in in between all that a chance happening in my life was that uh, a man came to me called David Levy who's now become quite famous because he published a book called um, Sex, Love and Robots. And that's made him quite famous. If you look up David Levy, there are many David Levy's. 
he made his living making chess machines originally. He was a chess grandmaster. But then he started to get interested in um, in uh, sex, love, and robots, and now he's a big guru on television and chat shows. But he got interested in human conversation, and he wanted to win something called the, um, well, it was a form of the Turing test, okay? Um, it was a test that was done every year to see which was the best conversational machine. And this competition had a very bad reputation among AI researchers. We said, oh, they're just chatbots. They're superficial chatbots and not interesting. They don't use AI. Well, people have stopped saying that now. We can see now that there's not a complete difference between the conversational systems that AI people build with belief and high-level technologies and these quite superficial chatbots that, frankly, amateurs had been building since the 60s. Mm -hmm. People in their garages were writing chatbots and trying to use them for things. And these two movements have sort of converged. So David Levy gave my team at Sheffield England some money and we did win the uh, the prize for him. He got the prize because he paid for it. But our team did it. And that, in 98, was the beginning for me of being interested in explicitly in human machine conversation, which is what I've stayed interested in ever since and still am. And although it didn't directly come from my interest in machine translation, it still used some of the same methods and structures and general approaches. And uh, so I've had bits and pieces of my colleagues and teams working on a theory and practice of conversational systems ever since. And uh, it's been huge fun. We've done some of it here uh, with a veterans lab in Tampa trying to create a conversationist for people who are quite brain damaged and don't want to talk to people anymore, but sometimes they're happy to talk to machines. Hmm. Yeah, very, very, very interesting. Um, and you've sketched out a, a, a wide range of different areas that, that of human language technology that you've worked on. Um, everything uh, and, and more beyond what you've stated, you've worked in understanding language, generating language, translating language, dialogue, dialoguing with a human, extracting meaning from language, detecting the correct word sense of ambiguous words, understanding the underlying belief or sentiment of, of words or statements, question answering, and a, and a whole lot more. Where do you think your work has had the biggest impact? And um, you've mentioned conversational systems. What is this the area that you're you're focused on now? And also another question: Thinking ahead to the future, how do you see the application of your work in real world environments? Well, I don't think one can be. This one's very very lucky and very very famous. I don't think you can know what influence you've had. I mean, obviously, I get some citations and I look at Google Scholar like everybody to see what's going on, how's one doing, you know. But you can't really tell. I mean, I suppose I've got the most citations for early work. Uh, of the work I talked about with semantic representation. That work was given the name preference semantics, and it was a certain kind of, I didn't mention this earlier, but it was a, a sort of algorithm for trying to get the right meaning representation by making the most coherent representation. And that sort of caught on. It got into the AI textbooks and so on. The the belief system work and the conversation work, I think you've got a you know, reasonable number of citations, but in each case, I wanted to make a specific claim about the processes and structures needed to do that. And in the case of the belief work, I think I, you know, it's one of the paradigms out there, but it's not the leading one. Um, I still believe that having this, what I would call a recursive nested set of belief environments is a necessary part of understanding what people are saying and doing. I have to be able to compute not only what you believe, but what you believe about me and what you believe about my beliefs and so on. But people either buy this or they don't. And I mean, you know, there's enough people out there believe it that I'm happy. And that's work I can deploy in my in my in my current work. Um, conversational structures, I was peddling for some time a view that um, the driving mechanism, and after all, AI always in the end has to be about mechanism. We can't just be linguists who make claims about language. We have to have mechanisms that we can program. Uh, would be a stack of networks, and that we uh, that dialogue runs by having a stack of networks, each of which is running a particular topic or a particular thing we want to convince the other person of in the dialogue. And stack is a technical notion in computing, but I think people can guess it. It's like a stack of dinner plates in a in a in a server in a in a restaurant, you, you take the top plate off and then you have to deal with the plate that's left, the next plate on top. You could only ever deal with the plate that's on top. 
And that is a very strong control mechanism, a very simple mechanism. And I believe that mechanism is sufficient to understand most of what we can do in dialogue in that um, it's very difficult to return to a piece of dialogue that's a long way down the stack. You have to do special things to get there. People can only understand you if you jump around in dialogue in a certain controlled way. If you start bringing up a topic that you last discussed last week, it's very hard for people. They haven't kept that stack like that, and they can't they can't get beyond the top plate. Um, so things must, in other words, to put it crudely, things must be related to what you've talked about fairly recently, um, and that's true. Everybody knows that. It's not deep. It's just trying to find a mechanism to express that. I'm not sure that mechanism is caught on, but you know there are many theories out there of what the control mechanism for a dialogue system should be, and the one I've been plugging is one of them. Um, dialogue systems, however, and Bonnie asked about the real world, are, of course, very hot right now. It's because, and this, again, is very much in th fits with the IHMC view of things. I mean, human-machine cooperation is, I'd say, the hottest topic in AI right now. And how we are going to control the world of automata we're building around us. How are we going to control the cars that are going to drive us? How are we going to talk to them? I mean, you, we're well, not going to talk to them in a coded language. We're going to talk to them in English. And how are we going to do that? And they understand us. It, 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 they're not going to be able to talk like computers and cooperate with us. They've got to talk like us. Otherwise, it's hopeless. Well, following up a little bit on, on what you just said, uh, can you talk about your recent work on uh, artificial companions. Yes, that was the last big project I had before I came to HMC. It was a huge um, European Union project. I mean, I don't know if you know, or if your listeners will ever want to know about European Union funding. It's a very, very bizarre thing. The grants are enormous. I'd say far too big. I think, I think they're a huge waste of taxpayer money. But they have a political purpose as well as a scientific one. They're to make people in different European countries work together. And since the spread of technological development between countries is so wide. I mean, let's be frank. I mean, you know, Greek computer science isn't very good. So they want everybody to work together so that Greece will work with Germany and that the expertise will rub off and spread. So in the end, the, the expertise will spread around the European Union. So this means lots of people have to be brought into projects who frankly don't contribute very much. They are takers. It's not at all the way things are done here where you assume that experts will get together and cooperate. There, it's a constant sort of mentoring process that good stuff will be passing down to countries who haven't done it yet but ought to be doing it. So that makes the grants very large, very inefficient. But the Companions Project was huge fun, and it was to create the kind of conversational companion. It went with a lot of talk and writing that I'd been doing in more general places over those years, the first five to ten years of this century. Um, I was arguing that... Um, and the words become common now, so what I'm saying now may sound just commonplace, but in 2000, it wasn't so commonplace. That just as people live a very long time with dogs, tell them their secrets. Uh, dogs don't listen, of course. Um, <laughs> don't care either. Um, people would have computer companions that would live with them for a long time. And people are lonely. They need companionship. There isn't enough companionship to go around. People are living alone. But if they had something like a handbag-sized thing that would talk to them, knew what they wanted to see on television, change the channels, tell them what the plot was of the soap opera they'd forgotten and where it had got to, and run their shopping for them, do, do all the things that we assume people can do on the web, but actually lots of people can't. A companion that understood English and knew all your tastes, knew your life, knew all about you, could probably run your life on the web. So the companion would really be part of the web for you. It'd be your inter interface of the web, talk to you. It would go. Th I was very influenced by the fact that I was told in old people's care homes, they spent each person is likely to spend a lot of the day looking at their old photographs, just going through them, seeing if they can remember who their children were and who their children married. Oh, you know, is that her? No, it's, oh, they get the names wrong. I mean, a computer companion is perfect for that. It would have the photographs. It would let you talk to it about them. Then when your memory began to go, it became, to use a word that Ken Ford likes, it would become an, an orthosis that in a sense knew about your pictures better than you did and could remind you, no, that's Jane, not Mary, you know, and no, she married Fred, not Bob. And they go, oh, of course she did, you know, of course she did. So in a way, it's sort of the companion would keep your 
debrief all your memories initially, but then keep your memories straight and help to keep you mentally alive. I do believe this is what's going to happen as care gets short and expensive. We are going to have these things. And people who say, oh, people won't want computer companions, the answer is very simple. It's going to be a lot better than no companion at all. And people will get to love them. I mean, David Levy, who I talked about with Love, Sex and Robots, he's amassed a lot of research, not done it, but showing that people are amazingly open to what they'll have relationships with. Just, you know, ducks will follow a, ducklings will follow a matchbox on a string if you pull it because they think it's a mother. Um, people will have emotional relationships with almost anything. The, the, the bar isn't that high. It's a bit depressing, really, isn't it? <laughs> wow. Uh, I think the application is, is um, fascinating. And I think, too, as... Um, you know, we're talking about a generation shift, too, where people are going to be more used to using the technology and the computers. So then I think, yeah, Absolutely. total shift. I mean, tell tell that to, you know, one of my parents. They'd be like, you know, okay, we can barely do email. But <laughs> so I think that they'll, they'll definitely have an impact as we move forward. Um, so speaking of uh, loving AI, <laughs> um, as Ken Ford has noted, after decades of pundits and philosophers arguing that AI is provably impossible, Suddenly, the argument has been replaced with the assertion that not only is it possible, but superhuman AI is so inevitable that it is the greatest danger ever faced by the human race. In only about a decade, the conversation has shifted from you can't do it to you shouldn't do it. Can you talk a little bit about this? I know. It's such fun, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, people's ability to maintain contradictory beliefs at once is wonderful. I mean, to go back for one instant to machine translation – People, some people used to say, oh, machine translation has been done, it's finished. Other people say, no, it's impossible, you can't do it. And sometimes you'd find they held both of those at once. So it's a bit like the situation you're describing, you know, with uh, the future of super intelligence, as it's sometimes called. I think it's entirely, I can't say media hype because it's not clear who's whipping it up. I mean, a lot of newspapers like this kind of thing. They're short of stuff. Um, so this kind of thing gets the public going, stokes their fears. And nearly all the pundits like Stephen Hawking and famous scientists who are now telling us how scared they are of AI are actually people who, I'm sorry, don't know anything about AI at all, have no contact with research, know nothing. Stephen Hawking knows no more about AI than anybody who reads the newspapers. You know, he, his mind is full of cosmology, which is no help. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so I think it's all absolutely nonsense. I think anybody who, almost anybody who works in AI knows that it isn't dangerous and it's much more primitive than we think. And the chances of it doing anything bad to us is minimal. I mean, look, automated weapons could do terrible things, but all weapons do terrible things. It's not because they're AI. The, the argument for automated weapons is that they save our troops and save our lives. It's not that... It, it's not... It's not <laughs> It's not what people think the problem is. Mm. Um, it's it's somewhere else. It's making sure the casualties fall on other people, not on us. I, I say I go over to weapons because, of course, AI weapons are the one place where they really would cost lives. But it's all done to save our lives, and that's what weapons are about. I'm afraid that's always been true. It was true of crossbows and you know other shotguns. Um, so it's not a special thing about AI. It's about weapons and armies and and and, and the the economic power of enemies. Mm. So that's another matter altogether. Um, but AI itself in, the, in, a, in a domestic and home and national environment, I simply do not believe this. I think we have to be very careful how it goes. Um, there are dangers, but they're not the catastrophic dangers that people are saying. I simply don't believe it. And I, I think it's quite irresponsible the way some people are whipping it up. You know? Media hype, exactly what you said. <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, you're really a wealth of knowledge for young researchers, sort of the quintessential mentor. Um, I know you're blushing, but um, what would you say has been your greatest impact as a mentor? And do you have any advice for aspiring investigators in the field of human language technology? Lord. <laughs> two, different, two very different things, aren't they? I mean, I've had a lot of PhD students who've got PhDs, obviously, over the years. You do if you have a university job. I think the first thing that hits me always is I, I, like, I very much like to treat them better than I was treated. Like a lot of people say, I'm going to treat my children better than my parents treated me. Of course, frequently they end up treating them just as badly because they can't control themselves. Parents, we know that. Their parents hit them, so they hit their kids. I mean, this is an unfortunate fact. However, in the world of mentoring, I 
I wasn't taught at all. I mean, I had a PhD advisor who wasn't the least interested in my work. He didn't have a PhD himself, because in those days people didn't. I mean, he was a very famous philosopher, but he had no PhD. He wasn't bothered with PhDs. That was for you know, low, low grade people. Um, so he was no <laughs> use. Um, so I was not taught at all. And so I've tried to make sure as a PhD advisor that I do teach them. And it's very difficult to do it in such a way as to persuade them they can do it, the sacrifices it'll mean, um, the disappointment they'll feel when they've got it, like after childbirth, you know, you feel let down, they, they tell me. Um, but it's worth it. And they should, and if they've got, if they want to do it, they should do it. And it's something, they shouldn't just see it as a meal ticket. But as for methods of teaching, I think the most common problem with PhD students that not everybody realizes is that their their writing is their initial writing is so compressed that only they can understand it. I don't know when they're writing other people's work. When they have original ideas they want to write down, it's often incomprehensible because it's over compressed gibberish that only they can understand. Mm -hmm. So I think the way, and I'm sure it was true of me, the only way out of that is to say, write me just one paragraph that's perfectly clear. And when they've done that, turn that paragraph into one completely clear page, and so on. So let something completely clear grow. Because what it is, it's like sort of, you know, concentrated coffee or something in the old Nescafe days, you know. It's, um, it's what they're doing is too concentrated. It's not vacuous, it's concentrated. They can't see that. They think they've said it. Well, look, here it is, here's what I want to do. No, no, I can't understand that, mm -hmm. you know. Just write, just write it out in one paragraph, and and so on. And I think this is a very important thing. It, it's the thing, especially very original people. If they're not original, if they're just copying stuff, then it's uninteresting. If they're copying stuff off the web, then that's probably lucid stuff, and it can be understood. I don't mean them. I mean people who have something to say, but it's very hard for them to learn to express it. But they can be taught, and I think that's the essence of mentoring, and that's my view anyway. As for researchers, lordy, I suppose the answer is. Be bold. I mean, there's a very different flavour to research now and 50 years ago. So there should be. But it was all virgin territory 50 years ago, and you could be bold. You could say completely crazy things, and people would sort of sort of half take you seriously. But you had to follow up. But now, I mean, Bonnie knows this as well as I do. I mean, one of the depressing features of our life now in research is that people get cock a hoop because they've advanced 1% in a score over somebody else in some well-understood task, and it doesn't stir the blood. It doesn't get you up in the morning, you know, oh, thank you. It, it's boring. So by being bold, I mean, I've been partly not being boring, but that's not an injunction itself. It's being bold. If you think you have anything original to say, say it and see where it takes you. Mm -hmm. Don't be put off because it doesn't fit the crowd around you or the department you've grown up in. No. Yeah. A step outside of that box. <laughs> um, so when you say that there are a zillion theories of language, what do you mean? Oh, I got quoted saying something like that a long time ago. <laughs> I got quoted, I did write it down somewhere, I think, that um, all theories of machine translation are true for some text. And what I meant by that was, um, no matter how stupid your theory of machine translation, there'll be some text it works for. So if you just say, oh, we'll substitute one word for another, which we know is wrong, you can't translate in general by taking this word of English and putting that word of German in. That's not. But there are some texts where you can. There really are. So you could find a text where that did it, but that wouldn't prove you were right. You know, I mean, so in other words, you may think this is contradicting what I just said about research. It doesn't, though, I don't think. Um, you can hold almost any theory about machine translation and find something that verifies it. It's not the same as having a very general theory that works. And of course, nowadays, fortunately, and this is a very good side effect of the statistical movement, we have to have quantity to make things look good. And if you have to have quantity, you can't fake it. Pat Supi, who I referred to earlier, the Stanford polymath, he used to say of any language processing claim, he said, come back when you can do a book. He meant, don't bother me with the fact you can do this to a few sentences. And how right he was, you know, a brilliant remark. It's really interesting. So with all of your work on the theory of language, I understand that you also speak several languages. What languages do you speak? Well, it's not very difficult speaking lots of languages. I mean, <laughs> I don't speak a lot. I, sp I speak several languages well enough. Um, Western European languages, French, German, Spanish, Italian. I spent a lot of time on Japanese once when I, I used to go there often. 
and I was fascinated by Japan and Japanese. Where I young man, I'd go and live in Japan for a while, I think. And I think it's a fascinating place. I lived in Africa too and, and used to speak Swahili, which again is a language so different from our own that it makes you think they see, I mean, they have 16 genders, put it that way. Well, they don't They don't think there are 16 sexes, although actually, of course, Facebook now recognizes 72 sexes. So um, <laughs> Swahili having 16 genders doesn't look so much fun as it once did. Mm-hmm. But because gender there doesn't really mean sex. It means noun classes which behave differently. Yeah. But Swahili has 16 noun classes. How completely insane. I mean, why would you design a language like that? I, I'm often puzzled. I think that's one of the few advantages of knowing a few languages at all is why would anybody design a language to do that? We're so lucky we live inside English because really English has had all the rough edges knocked off it. It doesn't have much junk attached to it. You don't have, you know, an Italian verb, you know, has 30 different forms. English verbs, you only have, usually only have two or three forms and that's quite enough, thank you. <laughs> so that's the advantage of knowing some languages. You see how badly the design job could be done. But they're quite happy in it. Italians are happy in Italian. The Japanese are happy in Japanese. I'm not making a quality remark. <laughs> yeah. What was the most difficult language for you to learn? Oh, Japanese. Japanese. Japanese is so different from us that, um, yes, yes, mm-hmm. yes. Um, so nowadays you divide your time between Oxford, England and Ocala, Florida, two very different places. <laughs> um, what do you enjoy about each? Well, my oscillation, my Backwards have always been too, it's partly been controlled by my health the last year or two. I used was half and half, and it's been a bit different lately. And uh, I have a family there, so of course I like having a family there. And uh, I do have a daughter in New York, but she's nowhere near Ocala. Um, they're just are towns with very different attractions. I mean, Oxford's a lovely old place with lots of attractions, but it's, you know, awful weather and it can get boring in a different way. Ocala is a lovely up and coming town, you know, and uh, and of course it's got IHMC. I mean, IHMC is unique. Um, I, uh, well, the thing, I, I'm just careful what I say here. I don't want Ken to think I'm just being nice about him. But, I mean, the, the thing in my history that IHMC is most like is what I talked about earlier is John McCarthy's AI lab at Stanford, which is run in a quite different way from anything I was used to or I think anything else in the States at the time. The rivals at the time were Minsky's MIT lab. Minsky's MIT lab had a party line. You know, people who worked at MIT, basically, there was a sort of, paradigm of research that they carried out. I don't mean that they were kept in sort of prison conditions, but but there was a party line. And John McCarthy's AI lab wasn't at all like that. John's theory was you hired smart people and let them get on with it. And if they never got any money, well, then they went away. But uh, And I, I do think agencies like that. And of course, for a researcher, that is the ideal environment. You're left to do what you want as long as you can find someone who's attracted by it and there isn't a party line. This is very important. Um, was it's, well, it's so different from where I started life with, I told you, with Margaret Masterman, who, for all her genius, was someone who couldn't stand the quiet life. So if there was no fuss or hysteria going on, she would create it. And that, of course, was wonderful and inspiring, but also deeply wearing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a time in your life for that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so you talked earlier about us telling our secrets to dogs, <laughs> and I understand that you yourself are a dog lover. Oh, yes. Tell us about your dogs and also what you think dogs might understand that we human, humans do not. Gosh, I'm very, very – I have a very high view of dogs. Not all animals, but a high view of dogs. I think dogs are I, – I glom every morning in Facebook onto research that shows that dogs are even smarter than we thought. Do you know this thing about dogs – are the only creatures apart from the higher apes that if you point at something with your finger, the dog, most animals just look at the finger and think, what's he doing? <laughs> Dogs like the higher apes look at what the finger's pointing at. I think that's really good. You know, and they remember where things are hidden away and they remember you and, uh, you know, and they're loyal and they sit on your grave and are sad when you're gone. I mean, dogs, I think, have a lot of attractive features. You know, I have two dogs. I have an elderly Italian hunting dog, Spinone, and a young German Shepherd, which was brought in by truck from the Czech Republic with its own passport. My, really? my wife ordered it on the web, <laughs> and a, ch- a Czech truck driver delivered it in a box. <laughs> That's the European Union for you. You can order dogs and they cross national borders in trucks to come towards wow. you. But no, I, I do think dogs, well, we all know people who like dogs like them, people who don't think they're disgusting and 
awful. In England now, we're having slight religious cultural problems because, you know, Muslims don't like dogs. So we have a growing Muslim population. And so you have to be more careful where you are with dogs in England now than you used to be. But basically, the population is still pretty much on the side of dogs. And so am I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think one of my... Um one of my qualifications is if you don't like, you know, dogs and cats and other animals, then you're out. You're oh, off absolutely. my list. Oh, <laughs> so. completely. I mean, isn't it extraordinary how horrified people in the West get when they see sort of the Chinese dog eating festival? Oh. You know, the Chinese have dog eating festivals, yeah. yes. and therefore you get the pictures in the press. We can't take too many of them, yeah. of dogs in cages waiting Horrifying. to be eaten, you know. And the, the horror that has for most people is. And yet, it's absurd, isn't it? Because cows, I mean, they're perfectly nice creatures to it. It's, it's complete, a companion it's creature. It's completely irrational. Yeah. And yet we feel it so strongly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so is there anything else that you'd like to discuss with us today? Discuss? No, you've been, uh, you've been challenging and wonderful. Yeah, it's this has been great. I just want to say I think it's brilliant of HMC to set up these podcasts. I mean, partly because they give subjects like me fun i mean I, i'm not sure this is going to give anybody else any pleasure but i've enjoyed this very very much thank you very much indeed oh, <laughs> it's been I've, wonderful i've enjoyed it very very much thank you so much york yeah thank you to both of you for joining us today thank you, thank you don stem talk stem talk stem talk stem talk. Stem, talk. stem talk wow that was lots of fun york is a guy with many deep interests and passions in addition to his discussion of ai topics I particularly enjoyed hearing him talk about his educational experiences, the early days of the internet, and the halcyon days at Stanford as AI was just getting its start. Absolutely. I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where one can find the show notes for this episode and find pointers to learn more about York and his work, stemtalk.us. Don, you and Bonnie Dorr did a really nice job on this interview. Of course, York is a wonderful person to interview in that he's full of great stories as well as insight. Yeah, thanks, Ken. It was great fun for me as well. This is Don Cornegas signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until next time we meet on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.